scotch tape. How, why is it that when I take a piece off, when I rip a piece off of here, and I take a second piece, they don't attach to each other? sticky stuff pulled electrons off the rest of the roll, thus charging this negative. Does that make sense to everybody? So each one is then charged negative. Um, how, do we, how do we make them attract to each other? Any ideas? Wait. Okay, so if we want them to attract, what do their charges need to be? Negative. One positive, one negative, right? <clears throat> and how do we get that? How do we accomplish that? Take it from somewhere else. Take the charges from somewhere else. Okay, but the, the sticky stuff always steals electrons, right? So if I stick one to the board and one to the table and rip them off, well, that's going to steal electrons from the board, and this one's going to steal electrons from the table, and they'll both be negative still. How do we make one positive and one negative? Um, stick them together. Sticky side to sticky side? No. What do I, how do I stick them? Sticky side to not sticky side? Yeah, if I stick them sticky side to sticky side, they'll both steal electrons from each other and the end result will be nothing. But if I stick them sticky side to non-sticky side, <coughs> Together, this would be called a dipole. Di meaning two, and they're, they're opposites, so it's a dipole. Okay, so dipoles exist, and so do quadrupoles and octopoles and all these other stuff. But we're not talking about any of that stuff. We're just talking about monopoles. That means just one charge flowing. Okay. <clears throat> so and and it flows through metal. This is why. Wires, if you cut them open, what are they made out of on the inside? Copper. Electricity flows much better through gold. 
Gold is a wonderful conductor. Why don't we have gold wires? It's expensive. It's very expensive. By the way, people do make gold wires. For in, in the high reliability market, what do I mean by high reliability market? I mean things you don't want to break, like heart pacemakers. You don't want that thing breaking on you, okay? Heart pacemakers, military aircraft. You don't want to be in the middle of a dogfight and have, you, what do I mean when I say dogfight? Two airplanes, you know, like the bad guys and the good guys fight each other, and all of a sudden your electronics quit. Like, you don't want that to happen, okay? There are certain things that are called high reliability. And guess what they make those wires out of? Gold. That's part of the reason why the stealth fighter cost, what was it, something like $3 billion or something, I don't know. But they're very expensive, and part of the reason is because all the wires are gold, okay? <coughs> uh, but for those of us who can't afford to buy stealth fighters, we just use copper. <coughs> Uh, coppers on the order of things that are conductive. Gold is the best. Copper's like number three. It's a pretty. It's considering the cost to conductivity ratio, copper's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Is gold the most out of like every object? Every material, every material that we know of at the moment. Okay. Now we might be able to come up with some combination, mix a couple things, and get some alloy that's a little bit better. But gold is. It's the gold standard. <laughs> uh, charge can be stored. Um, I should have brought a circuit board. How can you store charge? Well, uh, if you take, <clears throat> they do this all the time, it's actually almost every circuit board has one. You have a metal plate, and you take another metal plate, and what are these made out of? They're just any old metal tin will work, any metal can do. Okay? And you connect a wire up to this end, and a wire up to this end, and you put a battery in the middle. I don't know if I can draw a battery. There we go, a double A battery. Okay? So you put a battery on here. <coughs> This side is positive, this side is negative, that's what batteries do. Hey, wait a second. What do batteries do? Store charge. That's all they do. A battery is nothing more than a device that stores charge. That's why when you look at a battery, one end is positive, the other end is negative. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that's the side where all the negatives are, and the other side is where all the positives are. It's, it's a stored charge. So those charges are stored in the battery with chemicals. But now that you've got a battery, <coughs> the positives flow out of here, and as soon as the positive flows out of here, it wants to leave the battery. Why does it want to leave the battery? Because the other side is negative. It wants to get to the negative side as bad as it can. I know it's just a charge. It doesn't actually have a brain. It doesn't actually want anything. But opposites attract, okay? And so positives here want to get to the negative here, and the only way to get there is through the wires, okay? So this positive is going to leave here and flow up here and it's going to plant itself onto that disc. And it can't go across this air gap in between. So, but here's the thing. As soon as this thing becomes positive, there's positives and negatives over here. <clears throat> and so a positive is going to be repelled by it and it's going to leave. And so a positive is going to leave, which is going to leave behind a negative. And so then that positive is going to flow over here and, oh, finally make it over there. Okay. And it does this over and over and over um, until those, this one's charged negative and this one's charged positive. And this is stored charge. And now you can disconnect these wires and use this thing as a battery if you wanted to. <clears throat> uh, I left off yesterday with a question. I didn't finish that question. I made the observation that <clears throat> electrons have a charge. Do you all know that number? This is a number. Check your equation sheet. Is this number on the equation sheet? The charge of an electron. Is it on the equation sheet? I don't think it is. I don't think so. This might be one I want you to remember. This one you need to know. Whether it's 
The only question is, if it's on your equation sheet, you don't need to memorize it. If it's not on the equation sheet, you don't need to memorize it. This is chapter 11. So the charge of an electron. Why does Q stand for charge? I have no idea. I don't know. Why does P stand for momentum? They just pick the letters. Q stands for charge. E stands for electron. <coughs> negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. <coughs> and you need to know the charge of a proton as well. The charge of a proton. And this one's really easy because once you have that one, this one's the same thing. 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, except this one's positive. Same number for both. <clears throat> now here's the thing. A lot of money has been sunk into trying to figure out, are these two exactly the same charge, just one positive and one negative? And we've measured it out some 30 odd places, decimal places, just, just, just 30 decimal places. And as far as we can measure, they are exactly identical, which is kind of amazing. Two, two separate entities, a proton and an electron, and they have exactly, precisely, shockingly, the exact same charge. Now, if you've got, uh, <coughs> I think you all had chemistry in high school, physics, or no, in high school, Okay. What's what's the what's a hydrogen atom? What's it composed of? One proton. One proton. So there's a proton in the middle, and then what else is it composed of? An electron. An electron. And that's <coughs> an electron, and it's going around in this orbit. And yes, it's a cloud, and we're not going to get into that. But, <coughs> but there's a left. So what's the charge of a hydrogen atom? Why do you say zero? Because the proton has a positive charge and the electron has a negative charge and they cancel out. And the net charge is zero. Here's the thing. Everything on the periodic table works out. It's just that hydrogen has one proton, but you go up down, you go down the list, it just has more protons. But however many protons you have, that's how many electrons you have. It just works that way. <clears throat> so what's your charge? All of us are neutral. We're all zero. We all have a charge of zero. Can we be charged? Sure. Take, take a balloon. You all have done this before. Take a balloon and rub it on your hair. Okay? You all have done this before? And it, it won't do anything to my hair, but <coughs> those of you who have hair, you can rub it on your hair, and your hair will stand up and it'll be attracted to the balloon. Why? because the rubber on the balloon stole electrons from your hair, charging the balloon negative and your hair positive. Okay, and so you put the balloon out here and your hair, whoa, trying to get to it, because this is, your hair is positive and the balloon is negative. Thus, you now have a net positive charge. Does that make sense? But if you stand here like this, holding the balloon over here and your hair sticking out like that towards it for, I don't know, say, four hours or so, what's your hair gonna do over time? It's going gonna, it's gonna to fall back down. Why? Because the air has charge in it, and it's going to flow electrons back into your hair until your hair is neutral. Things tend to be neutral. They, it is the whole planet, one big neutral chunk of rock. Actually, let me try that again. The whole universe, one big neutral space. <clears throat> because for every proton, there's an electron. It's really nice. Now. What if it wasn't that way? What if these were just a little bit different? Like, let's just say this one was just a little bit different. Okay? Just, just think about this for a minute. <clears throat> now, how many molecules do you have in your body? Bigger. Many, many probably billions of billions, okay, you have many, many, many molecules, actually, 
way more than billions and billions. So that billions isn't even close. <laughs> yeah. So, so would it even matter if it was like point, point zero two off? Or? It would be huge because we have so many molecules in our body. One gram of us has <coughs> times 10 to the 23rd molecules. One gram. Okay, how many, how many are a billion? That's times 10. A billion is times 10 to the 9. Okay. A billion billion would be times 10 to the 18. Okay, we're talking about 10 to the 23rd. That's in one gram of us. How many grams are in us? A lot. Okay. <clears throat> Here, here's my point. Every one of these, if the charge was not the same, would be a little bit positive. Does that make sense? Because the net charge, there'd be less negative than there is positive, and the net charge in you would be a little bit positive for each molecule. But then you've got times 10 to the 23rd for every gram in you. Okay? So you would be pretty significantly positive. Does that make sense? Now, not only would you be, but you would be, and you would be, and you would be, and we all would be. Not only that, but this big ball of dirt we're standing on would also be positive. And guess what? It's got a lot more grams than you do. Which means it would have a lot more charge than you do. And what do positive, what do like charges do? They repel very strongly, I might add. Much stronger than gravity. I mean, I'm not talking a little stronger, I'm talking way stronger. Okay, so now, pause. <clears throat> You're positive, Earth's positive. What's going to happen? We're going, <laughs> gone, all of us. Okay, not only that, but the desks, <laughs> gone. Not only that, but the air we're breathing, where's that? <laughs> Everything's positive, everything's repelling, nothing's anywhere close, everything's, not only that, but you, yourself, you're composed of all these positively charged particles. What's gonna happen to you? You just blew up. Isn't it nice that everything is exactly, precisely, shockingly, exactly the same charge? We're all very conveniently neutral. Very convenient. <clears throat> Does this idea make sense? It's amazing this system we live in. That's just, 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 just right, no matter where you look. <clears throat> okay, so charges can be stored. Uh, if charges flow, they get hot. When you turn your computer on, what happens? Like this computer here. When I turn it on, the little light turns on, the screen lights up. Start sending electrons up there to tell the screen what to do. And, and, and you all hear this one. There's a fan in that one, right? And there's a fan in your computer. That's why in the back of the computer, you see these, this, this, these vents back here? Why are those vents there? Because there's a fan in there. Actually, there's two fans in here blowing heat out. Where'd the heat come from? The electricity. Yeah. When you, send when you send electricity through wires, wires warm up. It's just the way it is. Um, if you use, if you use a, a, an extension cord like this, and you're running something, a hefty piece of machinery like a big, heavy uh, weed eater, electric weed eater, you put this, your hand on this cord, it's going to feel warm, just because it is warm. It's, as the electrons flow through wires, it produces heat. And the thinner the wire, the warmer it gets. Y'all ever seen a light bulb? A good old fashioned light, not what I'm talking about one of these. I'm talking about a good old fashioned incandescent, the kind that are hard to find these days, but an incandescent light bulb. The kind that Thomas Edison invented. Okay? <clears throat> it's, it's just a glass bulb with a chunk of metal on the bottom. Y'all have all seen these, and there's like a bump on the bottom, and then right in here, there's this really skinny thing like that. Y'all ever thought about this? What's going on? Well, you send this 
This bottom here, that connects to the positive. And this side here, that connects to the negative. And so you just, you just hook this up to your battery. That's all it is. Hook this up to your battery, the positives go out of there, and the positives go, well, I guess it goes the other way. It doesn't matter which way it flows. Positives flow up into here, connects to this part, goes into here, and as it goes through this little itty bitty, you know what that thing's made out of? Tungsten. It's a really skinny metal, and it doesn't melt very nice, very easily. It will melt, but not very easily. Why do you want it not to melt? Because what are you doing to it? You're heating. You're heating. All you're doing is sending electrons through it. Nothing fancy. You're just sending electricity through it. And that causes it to warm up. And when it warms up, it gets red hot. Not just red hot, white hot. Actually, it's a little bit off white. It's a little kind of a, a yellow, pleasant glow. In fact, a lot of people hate these because they're like, ah, it's too, I don't like that color. I like the pretty old-fashioned color. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, my mom is, she's like, she hates these lights and she does not want them in the house because she wants that color because that's what she's used to. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? <coughs> okay, these get very hot, don't touch them. They're hot. I can burn your fingers out quick. Y'all doing all right? By the way, I've been to the Thomas Edison Museum. The light bulb he built still glowing. Still works. Pretty cool. Still works. Uh, oh, there you go, light bulb. Uh, it causes heat. Um, we tend to flow electricity through copper. Why? Because it flows nicely through copper. Does it have to be copper? No. You can send it through tin, you can send it through steel, any metal you want, it'll go through. Can we send it through plastic? Yep. It just goes much, much slower. So we tend not to build electric circuits out of plastic. Why? Because it doesn't flow very well. It flows really well through metals. But it can flow through anything. It just it flows best through metal. This is why. Here's good old terra firma. What's terra firma? Earth. Earth. <laughs> this big rock that we're standing on. <clears throat> so so uh, here's you. That's you. Okay. You're on planet Earth and you're standing there. Okay. And the sun is beating down on the Earth. What happens to the Earth when the sun beats down on it? It gets warm. And what happens to that warmth that's on the ground? Where, what does it do? What happens when any object gets warm? You're warm right now. What are you doing? With the heat that's in you. This was last chapter. You're radiating that heat right out of you. So when the earth warms up, it radiates that heat. Where does it go? What well, goes into the air? Warms up the air. And what happens to air that's warm? It rises. These are all chapters we've already talked about. So as that air gets warm, it rises. And so all this air is flowing up. <clears throat> By the way, you ever noticed uh, why buzzards go in circles over fields and not over forests? Because over the field, the air is rising. So the buzzards will go in big circles above this, and they'll actually this, this warming, rising air is called a thermal, that's the word for it. And the buzzards will actually catch it and they'll, they never flap their wings. You watch them, they don't, they might flap like for just to get 10 feet off the ground, but once they're that high, they just, just go in a circle. And they'll just get higher and higher and higher and higher. You go out there in the afternoon, those buzzards are way up there. And they never flap their wings. This air is rising, it's called a thermal, but now here's the catch. In the summertime, the air can only go so high where it reaches a point where it turns into a cloud. The water that's in here, it reaches the dew point, and we're not talking about what all that means, but it reaches the dew point, and that's why there's a base to all the clouds. I don't know if you notice this, but on, when, on summer day, when you see all these nice puffy clouds, there's a flat base on all of them have the same base. That's the dew point altitude, okay? 
where the water, the air rises and rises and it gets to that point and it turns into a cloud. Okay? And so above that point it turns into a cloud and the air is still rising so then you get this cloud here and that cloud will get higher and higher and higher. You all see these clouds, right? And it gets really high until you get this part on here that's called the anvil. And the, 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 that's when fast air starts blowing the top off of it. <coughs> you all see this in the summertime, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? This air is rising. Now, as it rises up, that water that's in the air starts to fall. Nobody's ever experienced this in their life before, right? This is like daily summer activity, okay? And this water falls down, but then it catches that thermal and flies back up. Then it gets cold and turns into hail, and it falls back down. And this is the building of a thunderstorm. This is how it works, okay? But now here's the catch. As this stuff is circulating back and forth in here, eventually some of it starts to fall out. And if there's any wind, it'll fall out over here and not over there on the hot part. So this continues to make the storm bigger, even though the water's going over here, not cooling it down, okay? And this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's big and bad, and you don't want to be underneath this, and you're standing over here going, oh, this doesn't look good. Do you know the scene that I'm talking about? <coughs> This water, as it's going up and down, is building an electric charge. So what happens is, the bottom of the cloud becomes positive. And because the Earth is one big neutral chunk of rock, positives here are pushed away, and nothing but negatives are left over here. And now all of a sudden, doesn't look like that. All of a sudden, you have a very large capacitor of which you're standing in the middle. <clears throat> Air tends to not let electricity flow. Can it, though? Is it possible? Yes. Electricity can flow through anything. It flows best through metal. This is why you don't have metal kite strings but it can flow through air. And in fact, you've seen it because eventually, as that charge gets stronger and stronger and stronger, it wants, these positives want to get down there to the negatives, they will go down there, eventually. And that's what we call lightning. And it will go down there. Somebody says, but I thought lightning came up from the ground. But well, it, it does both. It, sometimes they come, they go simultaneously meet in the middle, sometimes it comes up, but it doesn't matter. They, it does both. But, <clears throat> there you go. It flows even through air. That was a long rabbit trail. Okay. Uh, you can use electricity to make a magnet. I don't have an example of this with me. Uh, you know, you all made electromagnets back in high school. You, this is usually like a ninth grade project, actually. You take a nail and you wrap a wire around it a whole bunch of times. It connects it to a battery and you can pick up paper clips without the nail. How many of you have done that in ninth grade or high school or somewhere along the line? Go home and do it. It's fun. I mean, I know you're like, that's for ninth graders, but it's, it's, it's kind of fun, actually. Yeah. So, similar to that situation, is that kind of the same way we get solar or clean energy from the sun? Kind of like solar energy is a whole new ball of wax, and uh, yeah, that's a whole. So the the light coming from the sun has energy, and that energy when it hits certain metals, namely silicon. It's got to be pure silicon. None of this. Well, there can be some impurities in there, but they're usually intentional. Things like gallium and other semiconductors. <coughs> but the process of getting it to be pure costs a lot, so that's why solar panels are expensive. Because you can't just take sand off the beach and make a solar panel. You got to have pure silicon. And so, when you get that, then, this, then the the energy from the sun hits the solar panels, and then. It, electrons will flow out of that. So yeah, it turns the solar panel into a battery, basically. But uh, 
that's another topic for another day. I was and I'm hoping curious. to talk a little bit about that in the next chapter. So we'll see if we get there this semester. We'll get close. But yeah, that's a whole other ball of wax. Oh yeah, magnets. So uh, you can do this. You can have uh, a nail. Okay. And if you wrap a wire around it, Connected to your battery, you can turn this nail into a magnet. And it will act just like a magnet. You can pick up paper clips with it. And the more times you wrap it around, the stronger that magnet becomes. And the bigger the battery, the stronger the magnet. <clears throat> you can make this thing so it's strong enough so you can attach this thing to a crane and pick it up and, and put it over a car and nothing happens. And then you flip the switch and send electricity through those wires, and you can pick the whole car up. Okay, this is how junkyards move cars. Uh, an electromagnet. And the idea is the north pole of the magnet is in the direction of the current. So if the current is flowing, you, your fingers wrap this way, and your thumb points to the north pole, the magnetic north pole. So as your fingers wrap this way, the north pole goes that way. Okay, so you can make magnets out of And this is pretty astounding, actually. And to talk through this, let me show you uh, an idea. This all works together. Uh, electricity causes magnets. Okay? Flowing electricity in circles causes magnets. Okay? Let me say that again. Flowing electricity going in a circle, not just go well. Do it straight line. Flowing electricity causes magnets, but also moving magnets cause electricity. Okay, here's what I mean. Let me show you. Can I borrow your pencil for a second, guys? This is just a copper pipe. I bought it from the hardware store. It's, okay, it's just copper pipe. This is just Bryce's pencil, okay? And I'm just going to drop it through just to show you it's nothing but a pipe, okay? There's nothing in there. It's just a pipe, okay? You're okay? You can look through here and see there's nothing in it, okay? And this is just a magnet. It's a nice strong magnet, but it's just a magnet. It's copper magnetic. No, copper's not magnetic. That's a really strong magnet. This is a magnet. The North Pole is coming out of there, okay? 
And as that magnetic field goes into this loop of metal, that's flux. A magnet, magnetic field in a loop is flux by definition. Okay? Nature hates a change in flux. Okay? So as I put this in here, it will try to make it so that the flux is zero. In other words, I'm dropping the magnet in, the flux is increasing. It says, uh-uh, I don't like that. And so it does the opposite. It tries to make it stop. And so here's what it does. It sends electricity through the walls of this copper tube this way to make a magnetic north pole that way to oppose the north pole that's falling down. So it literally makes a magnet opposing the flow of this magnet. And then as it drops further back and the south end is going away, it's going to try to make, it's going to flip it and make a north pole down to try to pull the south end back up. To try to, everything it does is try to stop this magnet flowing through. And, and you can see it, it definitely slows it down. Why doesn't it stop it completely? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Gravity's the issue. The gravity's trying to pull it down, certainly. It could stop it if, if, the electrons in this copper tube could flow as fast as they wanted. They want to flow super fast, but they can't because there's resistance. Everything has some resistance. If I made this out of gold, it would go even slower. Okay? <clears throat> but I can make this have less resistance if I make it really, really cold. And so if I get the resistance in this, zero, so there's no resistance in the copper tube, then when I drop the magnet in there, It'll just hang out there and not even go in. It, we would call that levitation. And it would truly levitate. And by the way, if you go to Japan and ride the train that levitates, that's how they do it. Okay, so does this idea kind of make sense to everybody? This is uh, Lenz and Faraday figured this out. And this, this is huge. Being able to use a magnet to generate electricity this has changed the world because that's how we have lights. That's how we have cameras and projectors and everything else. It's because you use magnets to generate electricity. <clears throat> Just change the flux. Okay, so what's a magnetic domain? Um, in, <clears throat> in any given magnet, these are nice, really strong magnets. stuck together that keeps it from falling over. Um, don't take these apart. But yeah, and try keep that one and this one at a separate table so they don't slam into each other and break. Okay. <coughs> uh, so in any magnet is what are called magnetic domains. And this is a picture of them. This is a uh, um, a piece of iron. That's all it is. It's just a piece of iron looking at it in a, uh, an electron microscope. And you can see the different colors. See how this one's a little bit darker color than this one? And then within this one, you can see there's dark and light, dark and light. And look at this one here. It's in stripes. You see that? And what those stripes are, are, uh, I think I've got the next picture of it. Yeah. These are domains. And within that domain, the north pole is pointing up or the north pole is pointing down. And when you can get those domains to all line up so they're all pointing in the same direction, 
then you've magnetized your object. So anything that's magnetic, namely nickel, cobalt, and iron, will have these domains in it. And if you can get all those domains to line up in the same direction, then it is magnetized. Most of the time, they're not lined up in the same direction. They're kind of, kind of hodgepodge like in that picture I just showed you. They're kind of all over the place. This, this part here is going to be north up, and this part here is going to be north down, this is going to have a mixed match of everything, and this, this piece of metal will not be magnetized. But if you can get them all to line up, then it will be magnetized. Uh, a soft versus a hard magnetic material. Uh, oh, well, let's see, I skipped ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic refers to a type of metal, um, namely nickel, cobalt, and iron. These are ferromagnetic. That means they're magnetic. If you, if you put them close to, so uh, look, this key ring here, the ring part here has a lot of iron in it. Okay? It's currently not magnetized, which means its domains are not lined up. So when I put it next to the table, nothing happens. But if I put it close to this magnet, all of a sudden, it sticks. Why is that? Well, that's because this magnet, which is magnetized, lines up the domains in the ring, and now they're both magnetized, and so then there's attraction. Okay? <clears throat> and so now I can put this next to that one, and you can even feel that the ring is now magnetized and attaches to the desk. Uh, soft versus hard magnetic material. Um, soft just means it's easily magnetized. Okay, so. Um, Something that's a hard, magnet, hard magnetization like this one, this one is hardened, all the domains are lined up, and it's hard to move any of them. This one is soft, meaning that as soon as I put this close to it, all the domains line up. But as soon as I remove this, all the domains go back to being all over the place. So this is a soft magnet. It's, it's magnetized when a magnet is touching it, but it's unmagnetized as soon as you move it away. That's soft. And as long as we're talking about this, um, let me show you. I've got all kinds of fun toys here. <coughs> uh, I have here this toy. Let me remove all the parts here. Plug in. Okay. What is this plugged into? The socket back there. What kind of electricity comes out of the socket? It's called AC, alternating current. And what does that mean? That means that the current goes this way, and then it turns around and goes this way. And then it goes this way, and then it goes this way. How often does it go back and forth? 60 hertz. That means 60 times per second. So it's, it's very quick. It's do, 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 60 times a second, OK? So that's, that's what's coming out of this wire, alternating current. Yeah, they're hard to pull apart, aren't they? But don't, don't pull those two apart. I mean, they can. OK. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, alternating current coming out of this. And it's going through this wire and goes into this and into this. And guess what that is? That's just a copper wire coiled up. And what happens when you have electricity flowing through a copper wire? It makes a magnet. So this, this wire is wrapped this way. It's going to make a north pole up that way. Does that make sense to everybody? Except what kind of electricity is this? Alternating current. So what does that mean about the magnet in here? First it's going this way, but then it turns around and goes the other way. And then it turns around and goes the other way. And then it goes the other way. How many times? 60 times every second. OK, does that make sense to you all? So this thing, when I flip this switch, you can hear it. It's, it's, there's nothing in there, so there's no moving parts. It's just the electricity making a magnetic field this way, and then this way, and then this way, and then 60 times a second. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Now this, this is an aluminum ring. Okay, it's just aluminum. Is aluminum magnetic? Let me say again, is aluminum ferromagnetic? No. No. What are the three metals that are ferromagnetic? Iron, cobalt, and nickel. nickel. Iron, nickel, cobalt. Is aluminum one of those three? It is not. It is not magnetic. Not magnetic, okay? <clears throat> but it is a metal loop. And what happens when you have a magnetic field increasing in a magnetic 
in a, in a metal loop. That's called flux. And if that flux is changing, what does nature do? Try to stop it from changing. It tries its best to stop it from changing. So as the magnetic field from this one is going up in here, trying to oppose it, going through here, it's going to oppose it by setting a north pole the other way. So it's going to send electricity through this loop, make a north pole, and oppose it. But then this is going to change, it's going to flip the other way, which is going to change the flux, which this hates, so it's going to flip the other way also and try to oppose it. So here's the idea. At every instant in time, there will be two magnets directly opposing each other. And what do what happens when you got a north pole and a north pole? They repel, right? Oh. <laughs> okay, does this make any we can we can put both of them on here. Oh. Okay, does this make sense to y'all? That there there there's no moving parts. The copper, not magnetic. Aluminum, not magnetic. And yet they make magnets and repel each other. Okay? Now, it gets more fun when you take this piece here because this is just iron. Soft iron. Now, what do I mean by soft? Iron is not soft. Anybody bat their head with iron before? It's not soft. Okay? What do I mean by soft iron? It's easily magnetizable. Okay? What that means is, when I put this in the middle of the copper wire, and it, the copper wire, makes a magnet in the middle of its coil, and there's soft iron in the middle of that coil, the iron will become magnetized the same as the copper coil, but it's soft. So as the coil flips, so does the iron, so it increases the magnetic field drastically. And if the magnetic field is increased, what do the aluminum rings do? They make stronger magnets to oppose it. And so the end result is, they shoot higher stuff. Make sense to everybody? And, and if you walk by here and you feel this coil, it's warm because you've been sending electricity in there. The coil's warm up. Okay, I think I'm out of time, so I'll see y'all later. By the way, this is a rail gun. I mean, we have a small version of it. This is how the Navy This is how the Navy's building missiles to launch them across the Mediterranean without gunpowder, just pour it anywhere they want, really. Oh, that's really smart.